We're back on the Half Court Press. Uh, a, a revised and updated version of the Half Half Court Press because Chris Hetty has left the World Herald for greener pastures, going to school, going back to school, going to help mold the youth. And uh, we wish him the best. In his place, though, Sam McEwen is here to talk some Husker hoops. I'll, I'll cover the Creighton side of things. We'll do our best to um, – talk on all the issues relevant to college basketball here locally sam welcome to the podcast yeah i am not a youth molder so uh, you have two kids yeah well, i'm molding them <laughs> but that's that's about it you um, about it too that's good yeah yeah uh, you know we'll miss chris and his enthusiasm and exuberance hello uh i've loved this podcast when you guys did it so uh, i have big shoes to fill um, but it's nice being on a podcast with you again. It's been like three years. That's right. That's right. It's we, the Pick Six podcast, which was which was your invention, and no. we've taken forward. But uh, but yeah, like it's it's been a while, and um, I'm just getting used to covering men's basketball. So I've covered uh, it, women's for a long good, time, good, and now uh, I'm doing men. So I'm, I'm I'm eager to sort of get your perspectives on the sport um, as the season goes on, and. and Obviously, you're inside on Husker Hoops. Well, we're recording this on a Monday, and it we're kind of it's kind of like a daring endeavor because anything and everything could change within the hour or the day. Like right. college basketball is so, sort of in the middle of a scheduling hurricane, you might say. Like this, there's so <laughs> much flying around, ideas, people are moving and and pulling out a tournament, starting their own tournament, Nebraska. We'll get to that in a second. Like, it's just it, – it's it, it was expected because um, the season was delayed for two weeks or has – it was announced the NCAA decided to delay this, the season for two weeks. It's going to start on November 20, 25th. But um, I don't know if you if, if anyone could really plan for sort of the chaos and, and the uh, – the back and forth that's been going on behind the scenes of college basketball as teams and leagues try to set up games, their non-conference games and, uh, and their league schedules at the same time. So at at some point here soon, I think you'll see a little bit more sort of solidification from leagues and some of these tournaments. You'll see like the actual brackets released or uh, scheduled dates released, or maybe even just a structural blueprint from leagues of like, Hey, we're going to play twice a week all the way till this date uh, or we're going to play um, four times in, in December, which is what it looks like the big East is going to do. Um, but at this moment in time, it, it is a little uncertain. So, but that's, the, that's, that's, Harry. that's the nature of COVID <laughs> the, the pandemic. That's just kind of a byproduct of what's been going on in college sports these days. So the, season, the schedule starts on November 25th. So that's kind of the release, of the hounds date when, when based on that, do you, when can they start practicing? Right. So they, they can practice just got moved back a, two, a couple of weeks too. So okay. October 14th is the preseason date or the date for the start of preseason practice. And you get, I think you get 30. So whatever, however you want to space those out between the 14th and November 25th, that's what teams do. They don't get their closed scrimmages this year though, um, which can sometimes prove valuable, uh, you, you know, match up against a, another power conference team and, and kind of get an idea of where guys stand. They're not going to get that. They're not going to get an exhibition game to get sort of a trial run. So um, I, I, I get the sense, Sam, that there's going to be a lot of teams that are sick of one another. Maybe that's too harsh of a term. Like, they're going to see a lot of each other. They've probably already seen a lot of each other. Oh, yeah. Sort of isolated together as, as a group working on skills and, and drills. And then they're going to start practice. And I always got the sense that college basketball players, if they started this their, their preseason training camp at the end of September, by mid-October, they were ready to go. Like, let's play. And what helped was they had an exhibition game maybe at the end of October, a closed scrimmage in the middle of October, so you could break it up a little bit, the monotony of, practice them for three hours or two and a half hours, however you go. So it's actually going to be kind of an interesting challenge for teams um, to try to uh, 
Uh, I mean, they certainly have the challenge of trying to stay safe and healthy, but then stay motivated because it's, they've already been together and already had to, uh, um, they, they, they haven't had sort of the natural breaks that, that are typically in the schedule um, in the preseason. So yeah. it'll be interesting. And you don't necessarily want to give them like a two week break from each other because then there's been some evidence that when players go on break or they're out of the routine, they, they get COVID. Yep. Cause they're yep. not, you know, player college athletes aren't monks, so they don't just like sit in their room and meditate for two weeks and then return to the court. When Oklahoma's football team got a break, <laughs> like twelve guys got got COVID, so yeah. you can't. You, you're hesitant to say, "All right, I I know we're all kind of tired of each other, so why don't you guys all just kind of, you know, you know, like if you were to say in October seventh, hey guys, get out of here for six days and." You know, get out, get out of this headspace, and go. You know, live your life, and then come back fresh. <laughs> it might come back with the disease. I know, right? You but can't. I, you, it's almost like you, you're just gonna have this. This year is just tough. Yeah, I think the mental sort of st- strain or challenge that that college athletes are gonna face is is one of those storylines that's hard to maybe um, express from our vantage point. But I'm sure behind the scenes, coaches are gonna be talking about it a lot, and, and it may impact the play. You know, maybe some of the craziness of college football has been a result of just sort of the, uh, the mental hurdles and obstacles that the players have to have to overcome. They're not playing defense in college football. There's not much defense getting played. That's all kind of coming around. Now Miami's yeah. playing good D, but, but there's a lot of teams that aren't, they're just not dialed in yet. I mean, Oklahoma's defense, it's always bad, but some of the breaks and busts they had in their first game were embarrassing. Like they weren't even LSU too. Like some of the stuff LSU was doing and it's lost in Mississippi state is stuff that if you did that and the second day at camp, uh, Bo Pelini, you know, he, he'd run you out of practice. So clearly things are not tightened the way they normally would be. And, and at least on the football side, it favors teams that got quarterbacks who know what the hell they're doing. I'm guessing in basketball, it's going to favor experienced teams. No, I think so know what they're doing and don't and don't have to don't have to look over the coach to know how to run an offense. And not just run plays, but also kind of the defensive thing. I think that's another piece that I'd be looking for at the start of the season. I mean, every team has their schemes and communications big and um it does require a lot of focus at times to to do your job but also be part of this sort of five man con- conglomerate where you're all moving together and, and helping one another. Um I think I think there's going to be a lot of issues at the start of the year from that yeah. standpoint. So it could be fun to watch, man. Like when the when the bubble first started in the NBA, I thought that while you know defense was decent, I thought the offense was ahead, and and you were seeing some really tremendous play. It was like it was really up tempo, and guys were attacking and and finding openings early in the shot clock. It was just back and forth, and I think college basketball could t- take that same form at, at least at the start of the year. Um, when teams are still starting to get settled in. Are you, you know, I was curious about what you think about this, Sam, because you you obviously spent a lot of time looking at the college football scene, but like college basketball essentially decided now it's going to have testing at this moment and has testing um, recommendations set in place by the NCAA. I think the leagues are going to turn it into requirements soon. Um, But essentially it's the same. Like right now, college basketball is starting two weeks later, but and like I said, there's going to be testing protocol in place and conferences are going to move up their schedule a little bit, but the, the essential sort of blueprint of the season is the same. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to go on the road, you're going to play in these tournaments, you're going to have league games home and away, and then there's going to be a league tournament and an NCAA tournament. That's the plan right now, and I understand there are more contingencies in place in case things mm-hmm. do go a little bit haywire, but... Is, is college basketball maybe missing – like, is, is, it a, is there a little bit of false hope here, thinking that it can operate in the same way that it has previously? Or, um, you know, should it – I mean, I don't know. Part of me thinks maybe it should have been a little bit more inventive and creative with the way that the season's structured, um, given that, you know, the challenges of the pandemic, obviously some are unforeseen, but – we know a little bit about what they're going to be up against trying to get a season in. What did you think about what has been laid out so far mm-hmm. and uh, what's been, what the plan is to this point? I figured the NCA would do everything it could 
to make things as normal as possible because I think the existence of the NCAA is at stake financially, and they have to have a tournament. They they and they can't have a tournament where they're only playing seven or nine games, and it's hard to determine. So I think they wanted to keep it as normal as possible so that they could do what they normally do and make their billion dollars this year, however much they make. Um, so I think I, I kind of felt like the NCAA had little to no governance over college football. And you saw the doctors, one of them comparing it to the Titanic, sort of lay that out. Within two or three weeks, it was like the Titanic uh, unsunk. <laughs> and it got back up on the water and it was floating along. <laughs> I mean, it's like they changed, they put a guy out there, uh, a heart doctor's like, you shouldn't cancel the season because of myocarditis. You know, and I'm like, two weeks ago, he said it was the Titanic. So, you know, I thought they were going to do that. Uh, I'm not surprised the NCAA did that. The NCAA controls the postseason, and as a result, teams either, either better heal too or be left behind. And so, in, in some ways, the NCAA took the power out of the president's hands, the conference president's hands, and said, look, y'all, if we're going to play – uh, you guys can do what you want to do, but we're still having our tournament. And if you and here are the parameters, and the minute you set up those parameters, everybody's going to keep up with the Joneses. So if Duke's going to play however many games, how many games can they play? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven total. So if Duke plays twenty-five, everybody else is going to want to play twenty-five. So you know, I thought that would happen. Two things work in the basketball's favor. One, um, the testing is further along. And so the way that I described it with football over the summer was imagine going up to a river and seeing the water rushing by so fast that even though there's rocks there to cross that river, you can't see them. And so you don't believe you can cross it. The water is slowed down because of antigen testing. And so even though you could slip and fall into that river, <laughs> you don't think you're going to because you can see the rocks. And so I think that's part of it. And then the other piece is the rosters are small enough to where you feel like maybe you can – do a better job of controlling, you know, the community that you're going to be in. Like a lot of times, and you tell me if I'm wrong, basketball guys kind of hang out with each other. And they, so you take 15 guys and you split it into two groups and it's two. You take 150 guys and split it into groups of 10 and that's 15. And then you get, you know, then you get their buddies and you get girls and all this other stuff. And it just changes the dynamic of how many people you're trying to corral. And the problem in football isn't been the positive test per se, but the quarantine, uh, the, you know, the contact tracing. And within the context of basketball, you got to figure half, half of each team probably has already had it. That probably helps. You don't know that for sure, but the teams will. And I think they probably have calculated that they think they're going to get through most of this if they get the testing down, down pat. So, yeah, I think there's a little bit of false hope involved, and it wouldn't surprise me if a team has to dump two or three games. But I'll say this, once three or four guys get it on your team, and if they gave it to everybody and then you're out of quarantine in, you know, 14 days, uh, your season's good to go. So that's probably the advantage they have. I'm, I'm not that surprised that they did it. I'm a little surprised, like when I was, you know, I'm talking to people about the Husker bubble, and they're like, oh, yeah, there's going to be fans and and I'm like, okay, like, this isn't an outdoor event. You know, this is an indoor event. And no. You better have great ventilation or otherwise, you know, those fans, aerosols, if you want to call it that, or they might just travel down, you know, the court as opposed to when a football field, the wind's blowing around. So I don't know. Like, it's – at this moment, I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but I, I think it's going to work better than football has. I think the two concerning pieces – you mentioned testing. I think the, the bigger power conference schools will be fine in that, but the smaller schools maybe not be able to keep up in the same way. So what solution is there for that piece of it? I think once you get to the NCAA tournament, the solution is the NCAA pays for testing and it's fine. Uh, but leading up to that, maybe if, if they're a power conference team hosting a mid-major or a low major, you, you might be responsible for their testing. Um, at, if you're going to a tournament, um, that those tournament organizers might be responsible for those test, tests as well. Um, and then the other thing that, that that's curious to me is is the quarantine. So you mentioned if a player, uh, unfortunately, it, it was unfortunate to, to test positive, like does that knock out the whole team for two weeks? Since that player is on the team practicing with those guys, like how do you know um, it, it 
in, in football, you'd see like a position group go down uh, because one player may had tested positive or maybe just had been in contact with somebody on campus who had tested positive. So mm-hmm. that whole position group is now done. But with the basketball team, I mean, they're all together, like you said. So two weeks is a long time in the season. So I would imagine, and maybe it's up to the leagues then, to create – windows in January and February where you can make up games. And uh, obviously it would be pretty heartbreaking for anyone to have their season cut short or to be like, what's going to happen in the NCAA tournament, I guess is the other question too. So there may be more of a, uh, a push to have more, uh, a more controlled environment, almost bubble like for the NCAA tournament yeah. um, just out of fairness. But So they just put every team, what do you think they do? Like four bubbles? Yeah, like each region is a bubble, yeah. something like that. You live um, in hotels around the arena. Right. But that would seem to favor, like, basketball complexes, in other words, like Orlando. Like, you would say, well, look, the East Regional this year is not going to be wherever the hell it was. It's going to be in Orlando. Uh, the West Regional is not going to be wherever it was. It's going to be in L.A. because we have six arenas. They, they do, too. They have, like, six arenas. In right. Angeles. So we're going we're gonna to reopen the Forum and Staples Center and whatever, however they play it, but – it feels like wouldn't they have to rethink where they're having the event? I, I would think so. Yeah. Um, and, and also maybe rethink the structure of it. Like, do you want to play maybe, maybe for a week you just play the whole, the whole like region instead of doing just two, like two weekends or maybe you have two regions go at the same time and then you start mm-hmm. the next region after that. I don't know. But, but, um, they don't. They definitely. There's definitely been some pushback uh, from coaches and, and college administrators about putting players in a bubble for an extended period of time. College players because of the mental strain that it's clearly had on NBA players who've been there for three months. Like they don't want to do that. Not even for a month. I don't think. So get that. Maybe maybe you just do um, two weeks at a time. Take a week off. Take take a couple of weeks off, and then do the Elite Eight, the Sweet 16 Elite Eight, then take a couple weeks off, do the Final Four. I don't know, but you're right. I think that I I would be surprised if the structure of the tournament is the same. But mm-hmm. then again, I'm, I guess I, I'm surprised right now because at, at this point, the structure of the season is relatively the same. Um, so we'll see if, if they have to adjust. Uh, like I said, from from the Big East standpoint, from Creighton standpoint, like there's, mul- there's like four or five contingency plans in place. Um, uh, for how how to operate in case I- if things take a turn for the worse, so to speak. Um, so they I guess they're hopeful. Is uh they're gonna go twenty conference games in the Big East? Twenty conference games that leave seven non-conference games for Creighton. Um, the Jays at this point are still locked in to play in the tournament in South Dakota. We can't call it the Battle for Atlantis. Those organizers got upset. Um, they said they've canceled, okay, they've canceled their tournament, and if the teams involved want to get together to play in an event, even though they're the same teams, like just don't call it the Battle for Atlanta. So uh, they'll play for the Battle for uh, South Dakota or something up there. Duke's Duke. likely not going to play, gonna but they could find an eighth team and 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 play up in South Dakota. Does that Duke would- even be any good? Are they? I mean, they're good. Decent. Yeah, it is more of a name brand thing. Like to right. say, I mean, I, I would imagine a lot of those teams wanted Duke in there because they could get the win. Yeah, like, Duke's gonna be Duke will be good because it's Duke and it recruits at a high level. But it's not. Um, I don't think it's top five good. Anyway, so that's three games for Creighton. In the, in the, assuming that thing gets put together and uh, they can figure out a plan for getting teams in and getting, getting them tested and keeping them safe. That's three games and at least four more non-conference. And I'd imagine Creighton wants to have a couple by games, even though you're, there's going to be some testing challenges and you're not going to, most likely you're not going to have fans, certainly not uh, the I normal size uh, crowd. So uh, the benefit of by games, it's kind of twofold. One, you get the paycheck for having the home games um, uh, in terms of bringing tickets and fans in. So that helps your program too. You get to most likely you get to win that game handily and play um, some of, some of your uh, younger players, your more developmental guys. 
and uh, and you can kind of work and tinker with some things, maybe experiment a little bit with some lineups. So how do you not call UNO from down the street? They won't do it though, will they? Will they? Will they? I, I, UNO's not a bad team. They're not. They're not a joke team. If there if there was a year to make make that game happen, <laughs> the year, right? year. Especially hey, it's a pandemic. We need a buy game. Who should we call? Should we call the team four miles down the road? Well, I, I do think you probably right now. No, let's no, let's not do that. I do think you have. There's probably sort of this sense of like, well, we we feel a little bit beholden to the teams that we already agreed to play, right? And so, if they can't do it, then maybe Hugh and O's at the top of the sort of contingency plan list, right? But what if you know? What if Creighton set the place out Dakota State on a Saturday, and then Friday four South Dakota play, State players test positive, right? But then. Creighton say, you know what, you know, let's play on Sunday. Yeah. I, I, I don't see why not. Or if it's January or February, maybe it's February 25th and the Big East is on a two week break because it's allowing the rest of the league to pick up games and, and, uh, and make up games. And Creighton's got all its league games in, but it still needs a non conference game. Mm-hmm. Play you know, maybe that, maybe that's a scenario, but. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I understand the logic behind it, Sam, because, like, I look at across college basketball, you see, like, Fort Wayne upset Indiana. You see what Wichita did to Kansas here in Omaha a few years ago when they finally got to play, like, little brother versus big brother type settings. It never works out for big brother in college basketball. Rarely, okay, it works out sometimes because you got the better team, more talent. But you play in a – the, the the two things that come to mind is like you play a, a motivated team that feels disrespected that has players that feel disrespected uh, you never know what you're going to get with them and then from the NCA you know tournament committee selection standpoint like they don't give you credit or 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 cut you some slack for the fact that you were playing the team that was like just had was on that day like it still goes in the book as a bold red loss right. and and it and for a team like Creighton which has kind of been on the fence for the NCAA tournament a few times yeah. over the last five six years and this this same logic applies to Nebraska too why Nebraska and UNO haven't played like, I don't think you, Nebraska's gonna they might they might you know uh, you know might I, I've heard you know his name floated for the bubble so hmm. now, but if you're, works, if you're sitting know. on the fence uh, or kind of even close like where, where Creighton has been the last few years in certain terms of the NCAA tournament, like they've been an eight seed, a six seed. Um, they got, they missed out and went to the NRT a couple of times. Like those, those scenarios, you're really not that far off from in or out. And if you have a loss to a, even, even a city rival, it hurts big time. Did they, did they turn the page from, I assume they have from last year. And here's my question. So like they were going to be, and they had final four opportunity last year. They could have played in the final four. Um, I thought they had a great team and they had guards and that's, you need that to be in the final four. So certainly they had a chance at that. A, have they kind of, have you kind of, is there any lingering frustration or sadness over the fact that they didn't get to do that? And B did winning the big East championship, give them sort of a finality and accomplishment that maybe lessens the blow a little. I don't think they so. won that. They won the Big East. No, they definitely Nobody did. Can get that piece away. You took away the NCAA tournament, but they get a banner, and the banner gets to stay up there forever because they won the conference on the final day of the regular season. You know, in the long term, perhaps, like when those guys are looking back on it, when the coaching staff looks back on it, it gives them something tangible to say that, yeah, something was accomplished this, right. that last season. But – in the short term, with all these players back, I mean, they're bringing back – Creighton's bringing back six of, six of its top eight rotation players, um, added in some pieces as well. Those guys, the way that – when I've talked to them, the way that they viewed it is like this year is an extension of last year. Last year, uh, they didn't get the – they still felt like they had things to accomplish, things to prove, and this yeah. year is the opportunity to do so. So I think it's like the book wasn't finished. You know, they're, they're on chapter 11 and there's still nine more chapters ago. Interesting. And so that's how it's all kind of combined into one. That's the way they're viewing it, which mm. might be a good thing because it's just a way to kind of keep yourself motivated and keep yourself from, from, you know, sort of slipping into those, that sense of complacency that you're, right. 
okay, yeah, you know, we're finished top seven in the country, so we're going to be good again this year. Now, there's still things that need to be worked out, and they're, they're going to have the look of a different team because they're actually going to have uh, a couple more traditional big men to throw into the to the rotation, and they're not going to have the ball dom- – like the, the two-way guy in Tyson Alexander who was a ball-dominant scorer on one end, and then you could go to him as, as your go-to guy defensively and he had the uh, stamina and sort of the, um, I don't know, maybe that that drive to do both really well and really efficiently. Like, they're going to miss that, but they obviously still have great players, and, and they're going to be one of the best teams in, in, the, in the country next year. So um, I, the other thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about schedule is, like, Nebraska-Creighton. Do you think that game is going to happen? I don't know. That's a great question. I think it's going to be – um, so the Big Ten is figuring out what they're going to do. Nebraska's held off on really saying much of anything um, outside of saying they're going to they're going to pull out of the Myrtle Beach Invitational, which they did. And the reason they were able to do that is because it occurred before the start of the season. Right. So any any MTE uh, that's that was before the official start of the season, you could say, well, you know we don't know where this is going to go. So even if you guys move to Orlando, we're going to pull out because it's not what we agreed to. Right. So it was like no and void. Yep. Some of these other MTVs that are after <laughs> they're still on. And so, you, you know, like it, there's a fee that you know, there's a cost to pulling out of them. So I think they want to try to put together a bubble um, that would have up to 16 teams. I don't know if it's going to have 16 teams. They probably charge a fee, obviously, uh, for teams to cover all the things that, you know, an, an event organizer would have to do, including testing, lodging, all that other stuff. Usually event organizers cover all that. And then like you just pay them and then they cover it and then they make whatever's on the overage. So you're not having individual teams trying to book hotels and stuff. So it kind of comes down to how many teams are able to get to come to this, how many teams can pay the fee um, how many games you're going to get out of it. You know, if you get four or five games out of it, I think a fee is probably worth it. So here's my question about that, Sam, because this is technically a multi-event, multi-team event tournament. And normally yeah. those mean, that means you're capped at three games. Mm-hmm. If you can, can I don't know if it's going to be a multi-team event. So, it, so it's not a multi-team. It's, it's a it bubble. It's something different. Yeah. Huh. I, it's hard for me to tell. Like, I'm not sure that it, it, this isn't just Nebraska, though. This is a question that, like, Louisville's hosting one of these. Duke's yeah. going to try to do one. Kentucky's going to do one. Like, are these now multi team events? And then, or, or are they just like bubbles, a neutral site game? Every game counts in the books. Because, and this is kind of a little bit sort of in the weeds here from a basketball rule standpoint. But, like, how, I guess, how many, the way that the rules, are set up is like if you're in a multi-team event you get you can actually play 27 games if you're not you're in you're you're limited to 25 games right um there was sort of some conversation about whether the ncaa should have made that distinction or not should just let let teams play find a way to play 27 however they they do it but uh I guess I am kind of curious. Maybe that's a question for the compliance department or I think it's the issue is is like how will they You know, because like, let's say you could play four or five games and you're just playing them because you're in this bubble and, you know, it's not a tournament. It's not a, it's not a, uh, you know, like a tree. Yeah. Bracket. bracket. Let's say if you have 16 teams in order to determine a champion from a 16 team tournament, hello, you have to play four games. Yeah. So if you have 16 teams, um, you could, in theory, break it into two and then just have two eight-game team tournaments. That's fine. Right. So, what I if would, you had what if you had two eight-game tournaments and then Nebraska, which was in bracket one, decided to just play two games against two teams from bracket two? That's right. Not that's not a t- part of a tournament. It's just two games. So maybe you could just say then, hey, it's mm-hmm. neutral side game. It's not part of the tournament. Maybe that's a workaround. I don't know. It'd probably be a, probably a home game for Nebraska, but yeah, be right night for let's say LSU and BYU just to throw two names out there. Um, you know, like that kind of, that kind of, <laughs> I don't know. And so, you know, um, maybe, I mean, Creighton's still doing this thing in Sioux Falls. Maybe, 
you know, maybe it could swing down and play a couple games in, in the it could game. or 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 you know I don't know I think it's I think that's going to be the hard part is what's going on with the Big Ten and and can the game get get salvaged this year it's uh it's in Lincoln um and I guess Sam that's the other question too is I, I, I'm sure I mean Creighton would be favored by probably double digits. I mean, Creighton's excellent team in Nebraska. Right. Team, but. but but if you're Nebraska, like you want you want you don't want to have one of your home games against Creighton in an arena with no fans. So you want right. Y- your preference would be, I would think, to either neutral side it or sort of suspend the series for a year so that you could play them next season with fans in your stadium. Because then you you miss. Not only do you miss the environment, the chance of getting an upset, mm-hmm. but you you miss the the. I mean, it's a big ticket game. Like that that place two years ago was on fire. It was sold out. It was, you know, a great environment. And how many how much money did Nebraska make that day with a sold out stadium? And and it would do something very similar this year if fans were there. So to miss out on that, I don't know. That, that I guess that's that's kind of another piece to the to the conversation of whether or not you'll see Creighton and Nebraska play. Um, and I think Nebraska like, be a better team next year, and I don't think Creighton's probably as good. Right, and so then like, maybe would rather would Creighton rather play them at home next year versus having to go to? Do you think Creighton cares? Like, I know they care about playing Nebraska and beating Nebraska, but do you think they're? They, I don't think I think they're kind of a. You tell me. Don't you think Creighton's kind of anywhere, anytime? You want to play Nebraska? We'll play you. We'll beat you. Yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> I don't think they're afraid to play. Well, I get that. I get that sense with the way that they've operated um, from a scheduling perspective the last couple of years. They've yeah. really amped it up, yeah. and you Maybe. know, this this year they were set to play one of the best teams in the Pac-12, Arizona State. They were going to play Kansas, uh, a, a team from the Big Ten in the Gap Games at Nebraska. Yeah. Um, in in this tournament, Battle for Atlantis. I mean, like Creighton. Yeah, you're 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 kind of right there that um, they're kind of in the big time, like. The big, they've elevated a great effect on them now that they feel like they're it just feels like a different program now like we're not we're not the we need to protect our 24 wins dana altman era <laughs> like we don't want to play anybody because we're afraid we'll lose they're in this like hey you know we're gonna we're gonna go do great in the big east so if we lose a couple of non-conference games we're just preparing ourselves for the ncaa tournament and I actually maybe Nebraska is kind of in that mold at this moment because of where where it is as a program building under Hoiberg. Do you do you get the sense that so that the this bubble is going to take place and it makes total sense that Nebraska would host something like this? It's got the access to the rapid testing um, that's secured for for football purposes. Um, it can you, we know the way that the the stadium is laid out and there's there's hotels downtown like they can do something like that's that, but. Uh, beyond that, I mean, they've got the AC, the Big Ten ACC Challenge. That that might be the non-conference right there. The bubble plus the Big Ten ACC Challenge, and that's it. And then the K-State game gets either canceled or moved to next year. Uh, I could see K-State in that bubble. K-State uh, in the bubble, yeah. Possibly. I, I, I've, I've heard Kansas State might be doing its own thing, though. I don't know. So, there's. I think they're going to have a pretty good feel for the bubble if they're able to pull it off. And it's not a guarantee because they, there's things that they're trying to get done – Again, I think there's going to be a fee attached to it. So they've got to find out if some smaller teams can come in. And here's the other thing. If this thing in Orlando falls apart, and remember, they did the NBA thing, and that was beautiful. But the, this Orlando thing is a whole different thing with college hoops because it took a million – we don't know how many millions of dollars the NBA spent to get this thing done. Down Reportedly, like what, it started at $150 million, and then I think $180 million was yeah. the next – like. <laughs> Yeah, there's no – I mean, the NBA is not going to give college basketball or whoever's organizing – Disney and ESPN $150 million to do it for college hoops. Yeah. So there's a possibility that a lot of the tournaments in Orlando fall apart. And if they do, those teams are going to be looking for something to do and they might they might just see, you know, an opportunity in Nebraska where, you know, I mean, the cases actually are going up in Lincoln, but you're not necessarily dealing with as much and you just – you just never know. Like it's possible, so I don't think I, I think the bubble thing. They, you know, they can take a couple of weeks to kind of figure out what's going to happen. I think it'd be great if Creighton were in it. I think, and first again, they do plan fans. I think that would be a tremendous opportunity for Creighton fans uh, to be able to come down and see that. But I, you know, it, it surprises me a little that they'd want to go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, if there was a if there was a bubble in Lincoln. 
Um, it just it made, part, I think part of that is though, Sam, like caliber of the teams. Yeah, the teams involved, and they've kind of already gone down this path. You know, like it, it's not like two days ago they just suddenly decided to go to like they've been kind of planning. Hey, they. I, I remember having a conversation with someone in June about like what is the battle for Atlantis going to look like? And like, so they're, they've been thinking about and working together as a, uh, this little 17, 18 pod. Well, 17, cause Duke's out most likely um, for a while to play in this. And so that's, maybe that's part of it. And, and if, if Creighton pulls out of that tournament, then what happens to the other six teams that are in it? You know, so maybe there's sort of a commitment level there too. Well, Duke's going to have to pay money to pull out. They, they can't, yeah. you can't walk well, out. Of no, I don't think so because the, the, the event was technically canceled. Oh, gotcha. So that makes sense. Um, I think that Duke's in the clear there, but we'll see. I mean, like that's it, true. No, I, yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, I mean, it's a good field. Uh, Memphis, Ohio State, Texas a and Utah, West Virginia, and Wichita State. It's a good field. It's an opportunity to play Wichita State again. Yep. which is great, I guess. Um, but well, and I mean, like, Creighton could win it. You know, it could. It, you could win it and and, yeah. and get yourself off. Uh, to a really good start and get some eyeballs on you because it'll be one of the premier uh, tournaments to start the start the season. It's like the uh, best tournament, but it, it, uh, if Duke were in it, it would be like the very best. Yeah, you never know. You just you never know. I don't know. It'd be kind of cool if Nebraska and Creighton were in that thing together, and Creighton was clearly would be the best team in it. So I mean, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't want to be the best, the, like head and shoulders best team in in that event, but. It would be, I think, because they're going to be preseason top 10, right? I, I think so. Yeah. Um, maybe top 15 to be conservative, but um, is Trey McGowan's going to get this waiver well, sure for, for Nebraska? I'd like that to be true. They're handing them out like candy. Yeah. According to John Rothstein, <laughs> the, uh, the CBS guy that repeats, that reports on all of these as they happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so they they sure they sure like to think so. Um, I think on the women's side, and I covered women's basketball in the past, and I will somewhat still. They think they're going to get both of those. One of them for good reason, uh, because the gal was part of the Texas Tech program where they abused all the players. But um, it's not funny. It was horrible, but it was obvious that she was going to get a, a waiver. Um, but uh, yeah, Trey McGowan's. I think they they very much like. They'd very much like to get him there, and if they do, then they have they have. I think they have a very good idea of what their backcourt's going to be. They have a lot of depth, and they have actually a lot of experience. Um, it's not experience at Nebraska, but it's a lot of experience. And you know, you get Kobe Webster, who is a three-year starter at Western Illinois. Uh, you get Trey McGowan's, who is a two-year, you know, very experienced player at uh, Pittsburgh you get Thor and Thor is kind of a wing he's I don't know he's not he's not you know a guard guard he's not point guard um so you got Thor and he you know he had a lot of experience last year Teddy Allen who is uh experienced at West Virginia and then practiced at Wichita State uh so you know I mean Teddy Teddy's a good college basketball player now he's got to prove that over and over and over again and not get in big fights with the coaches and not, and not get uh, in trouble off the court. But I don't think there's really a whole lot of question about Tony Allen's ability to play college basketball. Uh, if he plays 30 minutes a night, he's going to score. And he's probably going to score in double digits. He's probably going to get three or four rebounds. Uh, he's probably going to get the line five or six times. So that means he's going to draw um, uh, a crap load of fouls. He's good at that. He's good at growing fouls. Uh, so Teddy Allen's a college basketball player. Um, so, you know, I mean, you start it right there and that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good group of, of players to kind of, to kind of, uh, to kind of go with. And then, I don't know, they've got, they've got a freshman point. They've got a freshman guard that I, I, I if, if you were going to ask me and I'm still learning this program, let's be clear. But if you were going to ask me like, what's, what's the player, you know, the least about that would probably be the guy that I would pick. <laughs> Like, I don't really know much about Elijah Wood. Um, yeah, he was like a late ad. Yes. Um, 
maybe someone did someone transfer or get out of a scholarship and then he came on like it was um it was late yeah but that but Elijah and, Woods late um but they that had, had a bunch of transfers in the off season but that doesn't necessarily like I like their top five and then Shamil I mean, Stevenson's a guard too he's a big yeah, yeah. I I the, the the group of transfers I'm curious there's there was sort of a that was kind of the undertone of the season last year is wait till these guys get eligible and, and let's see what kind of impact they can have. Obviously Delano Bain's the dude that, that. Yep. Earned and the he's most. the other guard. Well, guard forward. I don't know. They could do anything with Delano, I think, but yeah. right. Yeah. So they'll be small, but um, most likely because like, you know what Latin man, the way that they were talking about his shooting stroke, like he seems like a guy that's got to be on the court yep. and he's probably going to play the four or the five. Four. So, they're going to be small. They're going to have rebounding issues. They're going to have some defensive issues. But then again, the way the college basketball is played these days, as long if you can score efficiently, you got a chance to to have a good team. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, like I like what you said about experience. I think that's important. That was something that they missed last year, and I I feel like we talked about it before the season, but we underrated the impact of it. Um, just like how important it was going to be to for for like that whole roster last year didn't. Hadn't experienced what a, a D one battle was going to be on game day, and what Not it really. to there and how to work and learn from that, and, and go uh, do it again it, three days later. And so that was evident from the start. And I don't know if they ever really sorted sorted it out. Maybe maybe by the end of the year, but um, there's a talent upgrade and an experience upgrade. So and there's a chemistry upgrade. That chemistry that makes upgrade I'm too. Confident of. Um, there was a moment last year where Nebraska, you know, they were playing pretty well, even in Big Ten play. Um, they'd beaten Purdue. They'd beaten Iowa. And then they actually got, got a player back off suspension and got worse. Um, and I think – I suspect that this team will be a lot different in that regard. I think you've got some – some unselfish guys. I'm not saying that these aren't guys that want to play in the NBA. I think all every guy wants to play in the NBA. But uh, I think with Cam Mack and Gervais Green, the the sort of the sugar plum thing of the NBA was very very much in their mind. Like it, they were both coming out of junior college. They were both prolific players in junior college. I think they both came to Nebraska with the idea of playing in the NBA and using Nebraska as that launching pad. And, you know, actually things went pretty good for Cam Mack at times. Things didn't go quite as well for Gervais Green. And I, I just think that that kind of that hurt them a little bit. Isn't that um, kind of part of what Nebraska's selling, though? They are. Yeah, but I, I, think, I think simultaneously – you know, there was probably just not a as deep an appreciation for what you got to do in order to be that kind of player. Yeah. Um, and I think the challenge, and I always used to talk about Chris, to Chris about this um, before last season. I'm like, how are you going to get everybody to share the basketball on that team? Like, how are, how is Cam Mack and Jervé Green? Um, how how are those two guys specifically going to like get along? <laughs> like how are they going to, you know, how are they going to share the basketball? Because, uh, you know, those two guys, again, both were the guy at their school. And, you know, I just don't think Nebraska ever kind of got to that point where the chemistry was what it needed to be. Now, to be clear, I'm sure Trey McGowan's and Kobe Webster want to play in the NBA, but I think Kobe Webster is a pretty unselfish guy. Like he's coming to Nebraska to play big time basketball and, and to and to play a role as a leader versus it's, I think there's just a big difference between Kobe Webster and Cam Mack to start. Gotcha. I don't think it's about getting a triple double with Kobe Webster. I'm sure he'd love to get it, but he'd like to get a triple double on the way to win him by 14 or, you know, and playing really good defense and some of the things that Cam Mack was inconsistent with. So there's that. And then I think they would say that, you know, Teddy Allen is obviously a very gifted guy but Lat Man might be their most their their player with their biggest upside. You know, a guy that could actually score double digits every game and, you know, four or five rebounds. Like they think Lat Man's really good. And if he's that good, then they should be a much better team because they didn't really have that player last year. I mean, Hanif Cheatham is not six nine. Um, 
you know, so they, they didn't have a player like that last year, and they, they should hopefully be, you know, uh, they feel better about what they're going to be defensively um, with Mayan and Derek Walker being able to Yeah, play. Yeah, defensively, and then by shooting. <laughs> have, yeah. have more consistent shooters out there will be a, will be a plus two. It, <laughs> you pointed this out on Twitter, I think. The Big Ten is going to be good. That's what's going to be tough about sort of measuring what Nebraska is or maybe improvement year one to year two. Yeah, uh, because the league is really talented. So especially at the top, like if you're looking at top twenty preseason and top twenty five lists right now, there's like five, six, seven Big Ten teams on it, and a lot of them are in the top ten, top fifteen. So the league is returning a lot. Like a lot of its headliners are back, and it, like it, I mean, it's always competitive. But like I, I remember, I saw somebody, someone did like their power rankings of the big east or the big the big 10 and uh michigan state wasn't in the top three and i'm like what big 10 must be loaded this year if, the, if michigan state's not in your preseason top three uh which it, and that's fair like uh iowa illinois and wisconsin have a lot back they're going to be really experienced and, and really talented so this is a, it's going to be a good league man yeah, it's an off-brand year. So, like, your, your, your top teams are kind of off-brand teams. It's not Indiana. It's not Michigan State. I personally, and I've watched a lot of Big Ten basketball, I think Michigan is probably – is just obscenely talented. And um, Juwan Howard needs to get more out of that. And, you know, like, he needs to win 25 games this year. I think Michigan's got unbelievable talent and probably would have went a ways in the NCAA tournament if they got the right draw because they're, they just have so many good players. Well, they were getting healthy too. They had that in, right. a couple of injuries that really hurt them throughout the year last year. But yeah, so they had to change in some ways. But but man, they've got they've got some some gifted gifted players on that team. Um, but but Iowa has Luca Garza coming back. That's a big deal. Nebraska beat Iowa last year though, so they should feel good about that. Um, Illinois, yeah, I got to learn more about Illinois. Uh, watched a lot of Rutgers last year. They're in the top twenty. Um, and then Wisconsin, you know, I, I mean, Greg Gard got rid of one of his best players. Kobe King's a guy that left, by that's the way. That's right. Yep, that's right. And he replaced him with Elijah Wood. Um, but uh, and I wonder, you know, um, what Kobe King would have brought to, to Nebraska. But Kobe King left Wisconsin. They got better. And then just an amazing coaching job by Greg Gard and that team because that team's a sum of its parts. It's not a – you know, it, it isn't a an, – it was not near – if you put Creighton and Wisconsin on the same floor, I think Creighton wins by 10. And not because – I mean, because Creighton's more talented. I think Creighton works as hard as Wisconsin. And so, I don't think Creighton would have blinked for a half second against Wisconsin. But teams that didn't work as hard as Wisconsin got outworked by them, and they lost as a result. So, it's good league. It's good league. Yep, it's going to be hard. <laughs> so one Like, when Nebraska moved to the Big Ten – I remember thinking, I think the Big Ten's going to be hard in basketball. <laughs> and people were like, oh, no way. You know, the Big 12 is so much better. And I'm like, eh, yeah. Very physical teams, very, very big, very gifted big guys all over the place. Well, I Coaching think that really good. one yeah. of the things that makes the Big Ten so tough is you have brands like Iowa and Illinois and Minnesota and Purdue who aren't like – known as maybe Iowa's more big budget, but like they're, they're not, they're not the Ohio States, the Michigans, but they, but the level of care that or, or uh, uh, importance that basketball has is, is on the, they're on the same plane, you know, like Purdue cares about basketball as much as Ohio state does, even though it can't pour as much money into it. Like you've got Illinois with the same thing, like Illinois fired Bruce Weber after he made the NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm. So, like, <laughs> uh, Tubby Smith didn't last at Minnesota. Tubby Smith's one of the best coaches ever, you know? He made the NCAA tournament, I think, and it got fired. Yes, so, he did. <laughs> like, he did. That's, that, right. that's the level that you're talking about who you're competing against mm-hmm. in, in the Big Ten. That's why, it was, to me, I always thought it was harder, or it's going to be harder, is because you got all these programs that want to win at a high level in basketball, and and they put their money where their mouth is if they're not. So, that's – that's uh. It, it should be a fun year. It's it's technically true in the Big East too, but the big but the 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 uh, the teams that you normally associate with being elite in the Big East, 
like Georgetown and St. John's and maybe Connecticut have not been as good in recent years as, as um, well, certainly not as Creighton, but they just haven't been good enough even to make the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's a different dynamic. Um, I, there's almost, but there is almost sort of this level of desperation. I get the sense of from the big East because all the schools need basketball to op, like a, a school like Creighton, like basketball brings in what, like 90% of the revenue for the athletic department. Um, it's the same case for all the other schools. Like they need to win to stay. Uh, if you, if you have a couple down years, suddenly you are Georgetown or St. John's where you're fighting uphill to get back. And so I think that that it's a different sort of urgency, I feel like. Um, but it's certainly competitive. Like Providence doesn't want to doesn't want to be at the bottom of the league for a couple of years because it may be very hard to climb up um, past everybody. Like Marquette's kind of sitting there, or Butler. You know, they don't want to be down at the bottom for a couple of years. Suddenly, you're you're uh, that's where you are, and that's who you are. So um, that doesn't feel like that's going to be Creighton anytime soon, though. No, no, not 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 the way that they have it set up. Um, and we'll see what kind of recruiting gains that the Jays can make after um, after this last, like this last year and, and this year using it on the recruiting trail. So, um, certainly, yeah, my Creighton at this this is it's a it's an opportunity, you know. Like last year stinks the way that it ended, mm-hmm. uh, but this year you got to take advantage of it. Uh, they're going to be right there with Villanova. The 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 consensus from those who follow the sport. Um, they, they they assume that Villanova is the, the the top dog coming in. They're the league favorite, and I don't disagree with that. But what I'm my thought is is that both teams are bringing back the same amount of pieces, and uh, Villanova lost its best player in Sadiq Bay, and Creighton lost Tyshawn Alexander, and so um, that's it. Everyone's coming back from both rosters, so it's and and they split last year. Um, so like to me, it's a one A one B situation. Um, or at least I'm sure that's how Creighton looks at it, and and they should look at it that way. So now they have the opportunity to prove it on the court and get another Big Ten or Big East. Going over, um, but they're going to be like a preseason top five team, right? Going over, right? But that's one I like. If you're if you're in Creighton blue, like you look at Villanova and see say like that's us. Yeah. So even though they've got a, even though Creighton may have a number 14 in front of their name at the start of the season and Villanova's got a three. Like I think Creighton views itself at that level um, based on what it accomplished last year. And, and again, like the roster situation, it's the same. Uh, Creighton's going to look different now. Creighton's not going to go small ball with Denzel Mahoney at the five. Right. Um, and which caused some problems, but also created some other issues as well for, for the Jays that they had to mask. So it'll, it, Creighton's going to be different, but, it's still returning six of its top eight scorers, bringing four starters back, and Villanova's bringing four starters back, and uh, and adding a couple pieces just like Creighton. So we'll see. There's a lot of assumptions, and that's that's actually not wrong to assume that Jay Wright's going to get the best out of his bunch because he's the best coach in the league. Uh, but I think if you're Creighton, you're kind of feeling like, look, it, if you think Villanova can can do replicate what it did last year with the same roster, why can't we? And so that that's the motivation. Jay, Jay Wright decided he did not want to coach the Sixers. <laughs> that's what made me laugh. I was like, yeah, he doesn't want any part of the NBA. He could he could take any job in the NBA. He doesn't want it. He's got a good thing going right now. Right now, every time I talk to Jay Wright, uh, have a chance to interview him, he's like, he's like, he's the, in the best mood. Dressing sharp, you know, like this guy, I think he loves his job. So <laughs> there's, there's something to be said about that. If you're in a good position, why, why put yourself in, in, in sort of an added stress, stressful environment? Like, like John Beeline, if you can really nail him down, do you think he, like he was, I guess he was kind of done with the recruiting game and he was kind of frustrated that some of his uh, best players went pro, uh, even though they weren't necessarily guaranteed first round draft picks you know you've had to recycle and re you know retool roster year after year in in college ball yeah but if he could go back uh yeah 
Why did you go back? All right, last last question from me to you. Um, how do you pronounce the names? And you know who I'm talking about. All of Creighton to what, you guys. What, how in the world did they find these guys? And and how like how um how good are they? So right. Roddy and Modestus. I well, think it's an easier name. So tell me how to pronounce these names. Well, uh, hey, I'm guessing the same way you are. I, I think I know. I talked to M- Modestus, and he told me how to pronounce his last name, Kanslaris. Okay. Um, so I think that's it. And Rati and Oh, my God. That's unbelievable. It just, it just rolls off the tongue. Wow. Um, Rati and Oh, my God. <laughs> that's amazing. So, <laughs> uh, Rati's from Georgia. I hope that's right. Sorry, Rati, yeah. it's not, but it sounds good. So I'm going with it. Uh, and then they just, they just, Creighton just got a commitment from a 2021 guard in John Christopoulos. Yeah. So you got Andrana Castrovilla dishing to Chancellaris, who's passing to Christopoulos in a couple of years. Get ready for that. Um, how did I find these two guys? Well, it, it was Creighton has made a, uh, has increased its commitment to recruiting overseas. And that's largely because of assistant coach Alan Huss who has had ties. Like he, it, it kind of goes back to when he was a high school coach, he's running some programs in, in Illinois and Indiana and forming some relationships with people overseas. And so Greg McDermott, the way that he's, I mean, it's part of the hiring process. Obviously he's bringing in guys cause he wants to, uh, he, he wants their expertise. And from a recruiting standpoint, like, He'll look for guys with ties in certain areas, but he's also just kind of going to follow where they, where they work. And so brought in Alan Huss and he has ties overseas. So Creighton, while it had recruited, um, it's had some foreign players on its roster over the last few years. Um, it like, Hey, Huss has these connections. Let's go. And so it, it's kind of the same thing with, with Paul Lusk has connections in the Midwest. Let's go and recruit in his area. He's, he was the, the head coach at, Missouri State, so St. Louis, Kansas City. Like we're let's recruit right. that skill space. Yeah. Terrence Rencher. They just hired Terrence Rencher. He has ties in the West Coast in New York City area. Um, he's from the Bronx. He played college ball at Texas, coach in Texas, so he's recruiting ties in Texas. So they're just gonna go where these guys have connections. And so with Al Huss, he has connections overseas and he's been recruiting that scene for a long time. One of the things he said when I talked to him for a story over the summer about it was like, you know. It the way that the season normally lines up, it actually just makes sense to use the month of August when you normally aren't out on the road recruiting it, uh, in the country for AAU events. Right. That month to go overseas and watch guys play because what else are you doing? So right. you might as well, the same way that you spent July going to Vegas and Peach Jam and whatever, all these AAU events evaluating guys, then you just extend it into August and go to Europe and see guys. And so – uh, Modestus and Rati are two players that Creighton has been recruiting for a couple of years. They've been on their radar for a long time. They saw him play, and uh, they had one of the one of the first things you got to do when you're evaluating overseas guys or, or Europe, European players is determine whether or not they want to play college ball or not. Because a lot of them, if they're 14, 15, 16, um, maybe they're maybe they're thinking, "Hey, we're just, I'm just going pro in Europe," and that's sort of where my trajectory for my career I envision it going that way. That way. Well, if you can identify guys who think U.S. college is an option for them and they're pretty good and they can play at the high major level, then you start building that relationships and uh, relationship. And, and for Creighton, these two guys just happen to pop. Now, it hasn't worked at times. The, the Jays spent two years recruiting a, uh, a guy in Tristan Onaruna who ended up committing to te- – to, or committing and signing with Kansas. He's from the Netherlands, and, and Creighton was on him early. And, uh, and he ended up – I think he went to the U.S. to play high school ball in Utah and eventually blew up late in his recruitment in Kansas, got him. So put on a lot of time to recruit him. They've had other guys that they've gone to, uh, recruited in Australia. I mean, they recruited the kid Sam Froling and got him on campus. And then a pro opportunity ro- arose. And, um, and he, he, was, he, he would compare him versus the freshman from the U.S. Maybe that freshman from the U.S. isn't going to Australia after his freshman year. Just right. to do this pro opportunity, but Sam Froling, it was an opportunity to go home and uh, and do what he wanted to do in the first place, which was play pro ball in his home country. So, like, there's there's some risk involved with it, obviously, 
Um, but if you can if you can get it and, and it clicks and these guys perform well, then it's it's really no. I, I can understand why why Creighton's doing it. So we'll see how they uh, how they blend them in. And and I, I Rati looks like a guy who could play immediately. Um, we'll see where he fits because he's kind of like a combo guard piece. Um, whereas Modestus, I think, is a, is more of a de- developmental piece, but uh, both have an opportunity to sort of step in and, and do something immediately. Um, but, you know, Creighton's top mm, six, seven, it's kind of set. Six, seven, eight, maybe. Oh, even. sure. Yeah. They have a great, yeah. So it, 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 it's helpful this year knowing that if you got an injury or, man, positive test. And, and you're missing a guy from your rotation, you have some options available. Um, but for the future, I think that's kind of where uh, I, I'm intrigued to just see how these guys develop and adjust to the U.S. game and that kind of thing. So mm, That's really interesting. Yeah. So Rati comes from like, and I have never been there because I've never been to, to you know, um, Asia Minor or whatever you want to, call where George is but he comes from like one of the most beautiful and historical cities in the world so yeah Georgia yeah well Tbilisi is where he comes from it's a city yeah Yeah, it's in the country of Georgia which used to be part of the Soviet Union but I'm just fascinated by like how do you find these guys like where do you where do you go and that's so interesting that you laid it all out because if you look at Creighton's roster you see well this guy came from St. Louis this guy came from Kansas City these guys came from Europe there's a guy from from Australia. Yeah. Specifically, I think he's. They saw these guys. I think at maybe a FIBA U16 European tournament or something like that, like the Euro Championship um, in Belgrade or something like that. You know, like wherever. If you look up the European Championship, they've got like two divisions. And they have they host these big tournaments with multiple countries every year, and uh, a lot of college evaluators are there, and and that's where you you try to find these guys early and then start building relationships, just like you do here in in the states. Um, and and they were ultimately uh, the ones to land them, and and I they they come pretty high regard highly regarded. I mean, some of these analysts that have that have watched and evaluated. Uh, Rati and Dronikashvili's game. I mean, they've said some pretty high, uh, or they've they've had some pretty high praise for him. So there's always that question of, I mean, adjusting to a, a different style and, and a different country. So it'll be interesting to see how they do. But um, I know Creighton obviously likes them. So yeah. Well, hey, I mean, at this point, Creighton is has has uh, you you can trust the track record. Like they. They they recruit good guards, <laughs> right? They, they find good players. They're they're good at it. I mean, you know, Kyrie now, Tyshawn now, Marcus. They're good, and and Fred Hoiberg has that that that, that trademark too. Uh, you know, he had that at Iowa State, so um, I think that's part of what they pitch on the recruiting trail. I just think last year they 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 got some players in that I just don't think were you know the kind of had the mindset that necessarily they were looking for in terms of consistency and and they had a smaller pool to draw from they did as they got the job and and then made the ads late um yeah. well i i actually am curious to see how nebraska sort of evolves a little bit into the high school recruiting scene a little uh, uh, you know obviously right um What's interesting so far, Sam, is that we haven't seen a lot of Nebraska Creighton head to head recruiting battles, even though they both run program like their system is fairly similar, similar, like just the general concept of it, run and gun, uh, space the floor, space and pace, like Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of small ball shoot threes, like they look similar. They even run the same plays at times. They do. And they haven't really had any clashes yet, so maybe in 2022. Isaac Trout. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. A, Isaac Trout may not go to either school, but right, he might be too big for both of them. But 
I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious now that now that Nebraska's coaching staff has kind of established itself a little bit, got the lay of the land in the Midwest again. Um, how, how, how it sort of evolves in terms of its recruiting from a high school standpoint. I know they just lost that kid was Carter Witt from, uh, yeah. from he, but he's an East Coast guy, you know. So, and I understand yeah. Abdomasi has ties to the East Coast. He's at St. John's, for he how, however long, and yeah. It, and he he knows that that scene really well, but I would imagine that you're going to see Nebraska building a little bit more relationships with with people here locally in the Midwest, and maybe then we'll see those Creighton and Nebraska go after the same guys. Yeah, well, so yeah, I mean, Alvin Massey's got contacts seemingly everywhere in the world, but he especially has them in the East Coast, and I think they'll get good players. Uh, junior college wise, I mean. Doc Sadler's not going to get a lot of whatever for his recruiting. And I'm not saying, but Doc Sadler knows junior colleges really well. I mean, he used to coach him. His, one of his best friends is Billy Gillespie, who's at Ranger College. Uh, that's where they got one of their 2021 commits, uh, Kai Tamanaga. Uh, he's a Japanese uh, import, and he's one of the best three-point shooters in junior college. So, I mean, you know, I was like – I'm certain to try to research and look stuff up. And I'm like, how'd they get this guy? And I'm like, oh, Billy Gillespie's his coach. Like, that's That's got to be kind of a dot connection a little bit there. So, um, But, yeah, they, they know how to recruit. It's just a question of getting um, not only talented players, but guys that, that can all kind of fit together. And actually, again, they feel like they've got that. And I think part of the key is going to be Teddy Allen. I think Teddy works really hard and anybody who's ever watched his game or read Chris Hetty's story from last year or read Mike Sauter's stories about him over the years knows that Teddy cares very, very much. And if they can get him to a place where he's kind of the alpha, but he's doing it in a way that includes everybody and doesn't isolate him, they could be pretty good because Teddy Allen's pretty good. Um, So, you know, it just, that's just going to be the, I think that's important, and then I, yeah, I don't know anything about Lat Main other than what I've heard, and so I'm looking forward to hearing more about him and maybe watching a practice here or there. And but I think they feel really good, and then Delano Banton is the guy that I think they feel like is gonna, you know, just kind of explode. Um, he had moments at Western Kentucky, and then he had moments where he wasn't as good. But I think they feel like you know he's a guy that's a big time player, six nine guard, can kind of play above a lot of people. Maybe not their best three-point shooter, but, you know, can do a lot of things. So, I think they feel pretty good about their team. How good? I don't know. But it's a rebuild, man. It's a big rebuild. They were going to be rebuilding either way um, after Miles was let go. Even if Miles had kept the job, they were going to rebuild. So, they're going to have to kind of start over anyway. So, it's going to take three four years. Maybe. You never know. Basketball's kind of like if, 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 if Greg McDermott didn't have Doug McDermott, those first, you know, it might have taken it might have taken them two or three years to get to the NCAA tournament, like right. three or four years instead of two. Like they got there in year two because, you know, I mean, they well, had the best player in college basketball. <laughs> they had Doug yeah. McDermott. But, you know, if Doug hadn't been Greg's son, it might have taken a couple of years. Oh, you're talking about him building at Creighton. Yeah. I mean, Dan Altman didn't leave. I mean, Dan Altman was a good coach, okay? But when he left, like, the, the turning point for Creighton was they got Doug. Like, that yeah. that helped everything. If if Doug had said, oh, I'm going to stay at Northern Iowa, then I think it might have taken three or four years as opposed to two years. Hmm. Because well, And, and, and we, we talked about this, but I think the challenge of rebuilding in a, in a league like the Big Ten is, is – it, it, that just adds to it. Oh, yeah. You're right. All right, Sam, appreciate your time and your insight. Look forward to doing this again. Um, And hopefully we'll have a little bit more sort of like concrete answers about what the college basketball season will look like and when games are going to be played. That'll be fun (laughs) to break down a schedule maybe uh, to actually see some practices. Um, But we wanted to at least jump on here and kind of talk some hoops, give Sam a break from football a little bit and uh, dream a little bit about what college basketball might look like. So thanks for listening. We appreciate you saying thanks again.